Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to another weekend cook up, cook off, cook, cook on, whatever, whatever we want to call it. But uh, very excited to be uh, continuing this little series that that some of you have probably been a part of. And uh, the good part about today is we're going to go a little bit deeper and learn about how the research has been progressing because we have um, a special guest who's part of who's part of the uh, project who I'm going to introduce shortly, um, the wonderful Joe Lindsay. Of course, Kirsty's with us. But to get started, I want to acknowledge that I'm here on Gadigal and Bidigal land of the Eora in Sydney and uh, recognise uh, Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this project is all about food waste, which is intimately connected with caring for country because waste is such a problem. It's a problem that we are passing on to generations to come with uh, toxic landfills being left all around the country. So there's there's a big picture behind this, but it's also a daily picture because it's like, what can we do with leftovers? What can we do with those bits and pieces of food that, that uh, are just kind of uh, taking up real estate in the fridge on their own and not making up a full meal? But we're going to get into that. Um, can you, like always, let us know where you're joining us from? I'm here in Sydney. Kirsty and Joe are down in Melbourne. Um, has your beard grown again, of course, Carol uh, or Jay? <laughs> um, we've got Carol Marshall on Ngunnawal Country um, from Bridge. Denise James is in uh, South Australia. Welcome, South Australia. Sarah Abbott's over in Perth. Melissa's in Melbourne. Deborah's on the Gold Coast. Wow, we are starting to put satellites up all around the country. It's awesome to have you all here. And uh, waving a King Island in Tassie, that's it. We've got representation there. Cara, Cara Warren in Victoria. Hello, uh, Jasmine. Um, Mount Coolum on the Sunshine Coast. So that's Queensland, South Australia, Victoria, Western Australia. We're just looking for anyone from the NT. We've got Port Macquarie, Cremorne, Maruya. Uh, Redlands in Brisbane, Echuca in Victoria. Wow, this is great. Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you here. So let's get into it. And I'm going to bring uh, Kirsty Bishop-Fox, who, uh, who who has been uh, behind this, this little idea that we came up with. Kirsty, how are you going? Good. How are you, Costa? Yeah, really good. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic to be able to do another one of these. But, of course... Um, Get, get in touch with Joe and learn about, you know, what the statistics um, are saying about the research that's been going on around food waste. Yeah, absolutely. Before I jump in, I'll mention too, I think you mentioned that I'm on the Wurundjeri, so I'll uh, pay respect to my elders past, present and emerging um, as well. Um, but as, as for the research, I think that when it's really interesting, I'm so glad that I actually volunteered to do this because I just put my name down because I was interested because it's about waste and being a, a waste and sustainability educator, I always want to know what's what's going on. And uh, taking on this research or this social social um, research project, we'll, we'll call it, um, it really did evolve into from one small idea into something I think a, a fair bit more. And uh, it's been three years of research uh, in the making. And wow. it's perhaps we can bring Joe in because Joe can talk to the research much better than I can. Yeah, um, fantastic. Here she uh, comes. Hello, Joe. Hi, everyone. How are you going? Great to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm um, coming in from uh, Wurundjeri land, Woi Wurrung, down here in Melbourne. Oh, it's great. It's great. Great to have you here. Now, now, Kirsty, um, sort of make, give us the connection between how you and Joe uh, have have sort of worked this this work. You know, been involved with this little project. Yeah, well, it started with my connection with, with, with David Reynolds. And those who are watching who've watched the full series, he was in the first one where we actually went to our fr the bottom of our fridges and we cooked um, fritters. And, That's uh, right. And what Costa and David pulled out was almost um, identical with their pumpkin. Um, but it is, has been recorded. So I'll pop the link in later on. If you didn't see it, for those watching, you can go back and watch it there. Um, and Joe is one of the lead researchers. So she is correct me if I'm wrong, Joe. My understanding is you kind of you're overseeing um, David or working together as a team, but you're you're the, the lead, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I've been working with David and he's actually um, he's finished his uh, PhD now and he's got a fantastic um, 
postdoc fellowship in Singapore. So he's left us to go to Singapore. So anyway, we're we're keeping going um, without him. But uh, yeah, he's been great to work with. And our our study was um, it's about household innovation, and we're really interested in the things that householders can do because a lot of stuff around um, innovation in the sustainability field uh, is really about policymakers and uh, businesses. And there was really not anything about what households might like to do or what they could do. So we sent out the call for people to come and do a household experiment. And it was um, during the pandemic, so a pretty hard time to be experimenting with uh, uh, waste. But fantastic people did sign up. And uh, one of the community champions, we like to call them, was um, Kirsty. So people did a whole range of experiments in their households, you know, to reduce waste uh, overall or to live without plastic waste. Uh, some people... Uh, yeah, go on. Is my, what I did is a bit different to what most people did. Yeah, well, actually, there were a few people who did... We didn't really expect people to do community education, that kind of grassroots community education, but this is exactly um, what you've done. And it's so exciting that you um, roped Costa into it, Kirsty, because we're really, you know, riding on your coattails, Costa, to um, bring these low waste tips to everyone. Uh, yeah, and look, Joe, it's fantastic because, I mean, everyone in, in my community, everyone in the Gardening Australia community, I mean, they're so connected to their food in the sense of trying to grow their own or connecting with local growers markets. And, and as a result, you know, they, they, they don't want to end up with a fridge full of, um, you know, unused leftovers because, I mean, whilst they still can, they'll still cook it, but they kind of, they know they've grown it, so they really want to eat it. And, and that's a that's a kind of real grassroots embedded energy around growing your food because you don't chop the carrot with an inch on the end. You actually cook the whole thing and you've scrubbed it clean and you, you eat the stem as well. Like there's, there's that, that, that real meshing of, of effort to grow and effort to prepare and eat. Uh, it results in a lot less waste and then any of that waste that there is of course, gets composted and put back into the garden and becomes another veggie. Yeah, look, I think it's really um, so uh, important that uh, we value our food much more um, and, you know, and, and all sorts of, um, you know, materials really that we, uh, if we care about them, if you've grown things, uh, then you're going to um, be much more careful about, you know, how they're used. You're not going to let them uh, wither in the back of the fridge or you're going to feel really yeah. sad if you do. Yeah. Even Lynette, Lynette here said, you know, I've got a simple um, compost bin and she, she said, you know, cover the sides with some sage cloth, some wire mesh in a circle, put it on the garden bed, put scraps in it and, and leaves and, and any green waste. Great for singles who have a little garden and or, or or little waste um you, you know it's great lynette i love that because um you know you don't have to have a huge space you can always jump on share waste and take your food scraps um to someone who has compost or take it to the local community garden and Ange oliver just said you know we've just put a new worm farm together with uh, with her little man chase so um you know these are these are wonderful ways to to make those connections um to the to really valuing food, um, yeah. even the, the food, wherever we get it from. If we grow it ourselves, that, that comes with innate values. But if we buy it and then we have, you know, everything about Kirsty committing to this project was about showing people and, and not even showing, sharing ways mm -hmm. that we can all come up with simple recipes to go, hey, you know, you got all these scraps left in the fridge, turn it into something nice. Yep, absolutely. So, Kirsty, um, where are we? Where are we going to begin today? I know that we put out there for everyone the uh, the ingredients. Well, the well, the I suppose the pantry staples that are going to be the framework of the meal. Um, that are going to home home the 
the sort of uh, items that are getting to the end of the road. Uh, paint the picture. What are we doing? I've got some things prepared here. I know Joe has too. And um, let us know on the chat, everyone, who's who's cooking along and who's watching. Great. Um, this is one that we do. It's um, I don't do. I go through stages where I do it often, and then I do it less often. I like to be able to mix it up, but it's often the case of what have we got left? Um, I might go through the things that I've got. I may not use them all. Um, a little bit goes a long way um, with uh, with pizza. Um, what I've got is some um, pumpkin. Can you see that? Um, there's some pumpkin there on the screen. Change the screen. That's some pumpkin. Oh yeah. Leftover roast um, pumpkin. I'm going to do something a bit different with that. I'm sort of um, did a step ahead. I'm going to do something a bit different with this pumpkin. Pumpkin is a great one because people often think, okay, I'm going to make a pizza. I need to have a tomato base. Now, I like a tomato base if I've got spare tomato, but if I've got to buy a tin or a can of something or I don't have any jars left, then I try to think what else I can use. So I've actually um, pre-sort of um, pureed up um, some of that pumpkin. Oh. That's going to be the base of, of one. Um, and that's great too. I started using pumpkin this way many years ago. Fortunately, I don't have to at the time. My son had a lot of um, food intolerances and tomato was something we avoided. So pumpkin I used in, in pasta bases and the pizza bases instead. So we'll use some pumpkin there. Um, and I've also got the skins, which we'll be using too. Um, I've got um, a capsicum. And I don't know how well you'll see it. I hope you can. It's a little bit wrinkly. The light yep. might show it there. So it's it's had better days. And if I don't use it soon, then it's not going to be eaten. So we're, we're using that um, tonight. I've also got some other random things. I might get some feedback um, from you. I've got an avocado that's been sitting here for a while. Um, and I've got enough for two pizzas. I'm making two tonight. And I've got some um, onion, that um, caramelised onion, which is a bit um, that I've got here ready to go as well. But you can really do um, whatever. I might even, I think I've got a mushroom in the bottom of my fridge. And um, I'm going to experiment. I've never done this before, but I've got some slivered almonds, which um, have been sitting in my fridge for a while. I'm going to put that on, the, I think, with a pumpkin to give it some crunch. Um, so many random things. I've got some rocket. I pitched some rocket for a friend's garden because I didn't have any growing in mine. And I've got some other herbs. So we'll mix it up a bit and I might get some feedback from people watching to see what I can put on tonight. Well, what, uh, I'll tell you what. Hey. What have you got? All right. What have I got? I, I cooked up a, I had a dinner the other night and uh, this was. This is what, uh, yeah, so you can see that's what was left in the pans. You've got some broccoli, some zucchini, some carrots. And then I had a look in the fridge, uh, no, in the pantry, and I had a couple of um, potatoes. I had a sweet potato and a normal potato that were trying to do a jailbreak from the pantry and grow their way out. Um, so I peeled them up and steamed them. So there, there's some ingredients ready to go. While, while I was talking to you, I thought, you know, I've got my, my jar of um, super goikles, super pickled cucumbers, so I can easily throw some of that on. And then I've got herbs. I, I meant to run down the street maybe while Joe's doing something or you're doing something. I'll run down to my street garden and pick up some rosemary because I think the rosemary will go good with those two lots of potatoes. So... Look, it's going to be a bit of a carb fest in the sense that I've got potatoes on a bread base. But, you know, there is some greens in there. I'll pick a few leaves that I can throw on the top. And in the fridge, I remembered I've got, I've got a, a, a bit of fennel here oh, yes. that I can uh, shave onto it and maybe put in when I'm just uh, uh, finishing it off. And there's a little bit of tired kale, um, which I may or may not use. I'll see how I feel. So, yeah, I you've feel got like I've got plenty going on here. You've got a feet there. <laughs> What's that? I hope you can feed the whole street with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's, there's plenty going on. The pizza will be so heavy I won't be able to lift it. And then my friend bought this, which is some sort of, um, he's, he was when he was doing his chef course, he uh, he bought these and was cooking me pizza, um, and this was in the pantry too. So I'll have a crack using this high tech um, high tech jailbreak pizza 
thing, which um, does a pretty good job because it gets plenty of air underneath. Anyway, that's my story. Excellent. What have you got there, Jo? Yeah, well, my, I've got a pretty similar story. I did find some passata in the uh, fridge. I got some leftover pumpkin and veg from last night. I got a bit of capsicum. I got a bit of uh, mushies and a little bit of herbs from my pots. Um, I'm living in an apartment, and but I've got a few pots of herbs on, so I've got um, going out there. I've got oregano and uh, thyme, and yeah, I've got a bit of um, I've got a bit of spinach that's um, been probably seen better days. It'll come up all right. That's, that's it amazing. for me. Great. Well, if you two don't have your ovens on yet, now's a good time to put the oven on. Right, yeah. Good. Put it on for about 180. Just uh -huh. the moderate oven uh, will do the, do the trick. Now, I'm going to try and throw the way I'm going to do it, but there are a few different ways that I've tried and different ways that people will like, and you can mm -hmm. really mix it up. We're going to start by putting in flour. Self-raising flour is best. You could use plain flour, but I like to start self-raising because it just gives it a little bit more uh, don't need to be too fussy with the measurements. You can, you can fix this as you go. So I'm, I'm using one and a half cups. Now this will make about two medium-sized pizzas. If I'm going to be feeding more people, then I'll um, often double it. If I double it, I'll often use the food processor, which can be handy if you, if you have one. That's one and a half cups of flour. And then I'm putting in about 60 grams of butter. Now if you don't use butter or you don't have butter on hand, Oil can sometimes be easier to use um, in the sense that I'm actually doing this like a scondo and I'm actually rubbing the, the butter in with my, my fingertips. How and much was 50 it. grams? How much Sorry? did you say? How much 60, butter? 60 grams, about three tablespoons. Three tablespoons. Yeah, I, I tend to eyeball it. I don't, I don't measure it. If it's 40 grams, if it's 80 grams, it's going to be okay. Um, the first time I tried this recipe, it was a different variation. Was with from Jamie Oliver's. Um, Jamie Oliver has this great cookbook. It's like thirty minute meals. They usually take me an hour and a half. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've found that as well. I, I try. I just can't multitask like he does. I, I, I yeah, thirty minutes. <laughs> thirty <laughs> minutes when you've got. But if you do it more often, it does bring the time down. And I'm pretty oh, sure really? he uses oil. So just use whatever you have. If you don't have enough butter, use oil. Um, and then I'm just, so I'm just kind of getting it and crumbling it through with my fingers. If I was using oil, I would probably just get a spoon and mix it through like a wooden spoon or a spatula. Yeah. I really like to have. Yeah, I suppose recipe. it's going to take 30 minutes. It's going to take 30 minutes when you've got two people working away in the pantry. <laughs> <laughs> I just have never found those team. two people. That's like, right. And your team outside think, tending your garden. Yeah, they're. <laughs> They never come into the kitchen. Yeah. But, you know, that's all right. We're keeping it real, aren't we, Costa? Yeah, that's right. And that's how it should be because it's got to be, it's got to be the sort, sort of thing that, that you can do when, you know, you get home or, you know, you could do this, you could make these, these bases, you know, on a Sunday night and then you've got it for Monday so you don't have to do that prep on, on your way home. And I, I was down at the Nana... Flower and Garden Festival, and I did a co cook off with um, with Guy. Um, oh, what's Guy's last name? Oh, that's, that's an embarrassment. Um, he's he 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 uh, runs a restaurant at a winery down there. The name of which I should know. Sorry, Guy. I, um, and anyway, um, we made pasta, and um, you know, and that's the thing when you. You know, you can make it, and when you have a session and you make it, then you can freeze the little tortellinis or the raviolis, and then that gives you a really easy way to make a meal um, when you get home. And I do it quite regularly. You know, I get home late, I can easily heat up a bit of a bit of a tomato sauce base or a pesto base even, and um, and use those, throw those in frozen, and and I'm eating a meal within 25 minutes. Yeah. And that's, and that's definitely what you need. Something quick too. So this is, um, and, that, and that's what I like about this one, because if you do the traditional like yeast-based dough, it takes a lot longer. You've got to do it, you've got to let it rest, you've got to let it prove. Basically once the dough is made, we can use it straight away. 
Oh, and Sandy Middleton, 17 jars of tomato and ginger chutney. Ooh. Now, I think you're in England, so I can't come and get one. Oh, wouldn't <laughs> that be fun. nice? Mm. I think she's just showing off, but I like that she's showing off. Yeah. Are you mixing so, it yet or just? Oh, I, just, I just had to push ahead and mix mine. Yeah, and you can do it in the food processor, but not everyone has it in the food processor. And sometimes I've done, I do this with kids, and I love doing it with kids, kids actually getting in and understanding their food. So I've got that all the, the butter and um, flour mixed in. The other thing that I forgot to mention that I want to put in is the mustard. Now, mustard's optional, but I very rarely make it without the mustard. It just adds an extra bit of flavour to it and a bit of salt. Can I, um, can I ask everyone... Uh... Are you hot English mustard or are you Dijon or are you, um, you know, your, your classic seas, um, seeded, um, what's the seeded one? Um, um, oh, that's classic. Dijon. No. Oh. no. What are no. You? are you? I would just call it seeded mustard. I use seeded dry mustard, mustard, but you can use the, use the other mustards as well too. Whatever mustard you have is fine. It really is, is quite flexible, but I just use dry mustard all the time. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to go, I think I might go, I'm going to go hot English mustard tonight. Hot English, just, it's just only for me. For the base. I'm not cooking for a mixed audience. <laughs> <laughs> and you you might be cooking for, yeah, all those hot English people out there. <laughs> I'm going to put in milk tonight. You can put in water if you prefer, if you want to keep the dairy down. Now, I'm just going to give you a tip about milk. Um, sometimes I cook this recipe because my milk has started to go sour, which surprises a lot of people to hear. Um, a lot of people have this conception that the date on the milk is when you've got to throw that milk out and it's no good. Um, that's entirely not true. Um, I, I, I use sour milk um, for things like for, for in, in a base like this or in cakes or in pancakes or something like that. I won't drink it. I don't suggest you put it in a coffee. Um, but if your milk is just starting to turn, then it's a really good thing to And if you're freaking out by that, I'm going to compare it to something that's quite familiar, might be more familiar. Um, a buttermilk substitute that I use, if my milk isn't sour and I want to make pancakes, I'll put in some vinegar or lemon and intentionally sour it because it just works better in the recipe and it flavours the same way. And when my milk's gone sour in the fridge, it's kind of like nature helping me out and saving me on the process. So this is another way that you can um, use up that the end of the milk that may not have otherwise been used. And we're yeah, nice. Half, yeah. So I'm putting in half a cup of milk. So I've got one and a half cups of flour and half a cup of milk. So if you know that, that ratio. And I, I like the milk to water because it just makes it a bit softer. But if you try this at home, then try it with both and decide what you like better. You might prefer the milk, you might prefer the water. Use whatever you like. I'm just grabbing a um, spoon. And then I'll mix it all together. And if I wanted to um, make scones, I'd pretty much do the same thing, but without the mustard. Unless I was making a savoury, then I might include the mustard. I had this. I had this little. I, I was putting pepper into my pepper grinder some time back, and it it all fell on the ground. And then I picked it all up and I sieved it, and I had these broken bits left, and I thought, ah. I didn't want to put them in the grinder, so they've just been sitting there. So I've just put them into this mix. So I'll have pepper in the base as well as the hot yeah. English mustard. Ange Oliver, yeah, one hour from uh, the Gold Coast. You'll be down here. I can uh, make a second pizza when you arrive. Um, you can also add herbs into the base if you wanted to. Herbs or fresh herbs. Now, when it's just coming together, put it on your bench or a board oh, and we'll just, I tend to tip it out and just bring it together. I make sure there's nothing left in the bowl and what I'll do is I'll get a little bit of dough and just go around the edges so I'm not creating any waste in my bowl because I don't want to flush that down the sink. I want to be able to eat it. So I'm just going to finish this to bring it together. How 
are you going with your with your dough dough and crust? I'm just putting the liquid in now. I've put some herbs in there. So I'll put the liquid in and away we yeah, go. Yeah, mine's, mine's, um, mine's looking good, I think. Um, I've just put salt and pepper in mine. Yep. But it just came together really well. I put really thyme well. and rosemary. Oh, yeah. And you can add the, the herbs in there or you can add it onto the, the, the sauce or the base that you use, however you like. Now, you could make one large, but I prefer to do two small. That's largely to do with the size trays that I'm using. So I'm just going to cut this in half, and I'm approximately half. And then I'll just put it into two balls. And if it's if you, if you're at this point and it's really a bit too crumbly, then add a bit more moisture. And if it's a bit too sticky, then add a bit of extra flour. I find it usually works out okay, but I did this um, with some kids in a workshop um, a couple of months ago, and for some reason they were all, all different. It might have had something to do with the, with the measurements. So we might um, press that there. Now, in terms of rolling it out, I've got a pretty um, – I do a lot of baking, and I used to be um, – Costa won't know this, um, a cake decorator in previous life. So I've got this really? one to use um, and I love it. But if you don't have a rolling pin, there are lots of things you can do. Um, you can just push it out with your fingers if you want. You could grab clean the dishwasher, um, a glass. Actually, this is probably a glass here. I, I couldn't find my rolling pin, Kirsty, so I'm having a go with this um, Passata bottle. Passata oh, nice. bottle? Or you could use um, the... Nice the improv. You could use whatever you've got. So oh, your wine bottle, that's good. So you can, you, can use, you can use whatever. So the trick is to get some flour, just a little bit of flour on the board because you don't have to... The flour helps it to not stick. And it is a bit well, sticky. I'm happy with my dough now. I just had to add a little bit more flour just to give it that that texture to hold together. But look at that. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that looks good. That looks good. It's just really simple. If it's too sticky, you add more flour. And if it's too dry, you add a bit more liquid. Usually it's the flour that we tend to add a bit more of. And how big of thing you roll this? And look, I do two, two, two medium sized ones, but you can do, you could make, you know, five or six smaller ones if you wanted individual serves. Um, you could double it and then make a whole lot more. Um, but I, I tend to gauge it with the tray that you're using. I don't have a fancy tray like Costas. I've just got my, my basic baking trays um, that I'm using. Can you see that there? So use whatever tray you want. And if you don't have trays, you can actually use a fry pan. So you can just pop in your fry pan and use it, use it like that. That's wow. a good tip. Yeah. Well, just put it on the stove or in the oven. Yeah. I roll this fairly thin, as thin as I can realistically get it to fit in the, in the tray, and then I can put it straight into the oven without having to do anything else to it first. But if I had it, this is probably about... I would say it's about four mils. I'm going to get it down to about two or three mil. I don't get rulers out. I'm just eyeballing it, and I may be a bit wrong. Um, if, it's, if you like to have a thicker base, then I would either do one or two things. I'd either start it on the, in a pan on your stovetop um, for about five or so minutes, or I can put it in the oven for five minutes and then pull it out and then put my toppings on. Um, I used to do it that way, but um, sometimes I just can't be bothered. <laughs> So if I roll it a little bit thinner, I can get away with doing that first step. But you experiment yourselves and uh, do it how, how you like. But don't roll it too thin. My boys once had a competition, we'll call it that, to see how thin they could get it. And then it was really hard to handle. So then just put it on the tray, Kirsty. Yeah, put it straight on the tray. I, I like this one. An approximate 10 inches, it's never, ever perfectly round. If you get it perfectly round, then good luck to you, but that's okay. 
Um, if you can figure out, I'm trying to hold it up. So it's roundish, but it's definitely not perfect. But this is home cooking. It's fast, it's rustic, and it would take me far too long um, to get the perfect roundness every time. Okay, here we go. Um, I've got my round, and I'm glad um, Ange reckons her, her mum has a bowl exactly the same as this, and this was my grandmother's. So, you know, it kind of dates oh, back. That's nice. Yeah, it's a specky one. You've got good vibe, good vibes in that. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of good juju in that. Yeah. So I'll get my rolling pin. And if you're rolling it, it seems like it's sticking. It's just put the flower down for the next roll, and that will just help it glide, glide across. So I've got one roll out, and I'll pop it on the tray, and I'll roll out number two. That, that second camera of mine is just a wide shot. I, sh I should bring it in a bit closer. So tell us, Joe, while we're doing this rolling out, what other um, experiments or projects did people do at home? Yeah, so um, they uh, some people um, uh, put in gardens, so that's um, good to tell you about Costa. So... Um, yeah, so the, there was a there was one of the participants. She was living in an apartment um, block and uh, put in a garden and was able to uh, grow a bit of food in the six in the six weeks and um, also you know made friends with people in her um, in her block. Um, and other people were doing things around repairing. Um, repairing things in their houses uh, and uh, then others were doing things like trying to live without plastic waste and that actually sounds really simple but it's really very challenging and I think um, you know particularly during the uh, pandemic um, because uh, you uh, would go to you know those bulk food stores with your containers and uh, uh, get your groceries in that way instead of just nicking to the supermarket. And so people would have to drive around to different places to get things or to go to um, markets if they weren't nearby uh, to really reduce plastic waste. So I think we really learned from that that, um, uh, you know, small changes are easy, but the big changes like really trying to cut out all of plastic waste is um, super challenging. So we really need to make our systems work more easily um, so that people can do that. Um, yeah, so things are starting, you know, when you go to some uh, lots of shops and you can take your own containers in and, and all of that. But I think, you know, reducing plastic is one of the most challenging things uh, if you do regular uh, supermarket shopping. So... Yeah, so people changed the ways that they did shopping, they changed the ways that they did cooking, and they talked about what that meant um, in, their, in their families as well. And so for some people it went really well and it was easy and it's something they've continued, uh, but for others uh, they found it really challenging and so they wrote about what was challenging as well as um, what worked well. So that's, I, think, that's, I, think, I, I like to hear it. I like to hear about the challenges because, you know, that's where that's where you can connect with people who relate and say, yeah, I understand that, rather than it be this whole, you know, holy grail, I'm, I'm a genius and it all worked, happy ending, yay, hip, hip, hooray sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um, I, I think you know, that's, that's what we need to think about. You know, the individuals can make change, but we also need to encourage you know, our local uh, councils and, uh, you know, governments to come along with householders uh, as well. So it can't be all from the individual. It's just too hard to do it by ourselves. But if we can, um, you know, work together, then that that just opens up, you know, other doors of um, opportunity. Because a lot of the time we really need system change as well as, you know, people making individual changes. So... An example of that is, um, you know, the plastic band bag that um, uh, was introduced in Victoria 
Um, I'm sure it was introduced in New South Wales as well. Uh, so and just, people really just. Oh right. So how's it going up there, Costa? Are people um, adapting? I'll finish to what it you were saying, and, and I'll, I'll give you an update. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so with the plastic bag ban, there there was all sorts of toing and froing, and um, with the supermarkets about whether they were going to offer bags or not. But in the end, people have made the transition um, pretty easily, I'd say. So, uh, you know, we all are able to uh, take take bags when we go to the supermarket and because that ban was there it's so much easier than if you're just doing it by personal choice so it's kind of like um we really need systems to change to make low waste living easy and we need systems to change to make high waste um living a bit harder so we've got to stop being so convenient and make some of that you know kind of tone some of that down so a lot of it is really kind of going back to, um, you know, practices that maybe previous generations did, you know, growing things in your backyard, eating the food that you grow, um, uh, you know, making things from scratch. And I think a lot of people really experimented with that during the pandemic. Yeah, so... I have good, to say, good thing. Uh, shopping in supermarkets... Very challenging. In fact, it's, it's almost not possible to do waste-free in the supermarket. Um, for me to actually reduce the waste that I um, create, I, I shop differently. Um, yeah. I shop at the store and I can buy more of my things loose. Um, I shop at a, at a butcher's. I don't eat a lot of meat, but we do eat some meat and I can take my containers in with me. Um, I shop at, they call them a bulk store. I don't like that name because it, it makes people think they've got to buy in bulk. You don't have to buy in bulk. It's actually like an unpackaged store is what I like to, to call it. Um, I'm in the, the Croydon, so the food pantry is closest to me, but there's a lot of different ones popping up, like there's a source and all different types around look locally. So I can take my own containers in and reduce a huge amount of waste uh, like that. But supermarkets, some of them are taking steps, um, but generally speaking, it's, it's, it's far more challenging or really not um, practically possible. Yeah, that's fantastic, Kirsty. Yeah, and I think that you're... You're really on the, you know, on the on the leading edge of people who are, are, are really worried about waste and are really committed to, um, you know, shopping and cooking and doing all of that quite differently. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got here, I've got my, my bases rolled out and I'm about ready to top them. I've got the pumpkin puree that I made before. So I'm just going to get that, and I just eyeball things and do things a bit to, to taste. I've grated, I've grated some garlic up. I'm going to put some garlic in to, to flavour that up a bit, and I might put in some um, thyme. Got some thyme this morning from a friend. Okay, a bit of a rookie error here. I um I rolled it out onto the area that I hadn't flowered. So it started on one side and it's come up, but the other side sort of stuck a bit. But fortunately I had a little bit of spatula action and I think I can manage to lift it up and put it on. There we go. That's pretty good. That's what um, happens in the live where you don't have someone to do another take, isn't it, Costa? They get to, you get to keep it real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I don't want it to look like I'm a genius. Because <laughs> that's not the truth. <laughs> it's just Humpty Dumptyville here. <laughs> no, it's not. But I, but I love that that happened in the sense that uh, what I do, sometimes I do these as like, you know, cooking things for the kids. And if it goes perfectly and they go home and try it, then it can it, it, it can be frustrating. You think, why can't I do, I can't why can't I do it? So if it goes wrong in something like this, now everyone at home knows how to make the difference. If you remember, we did one of the salads last year and I demonstrated mayonnaise, and the worst possible thing happened and it split. But I got to show everyone how to fix it, which is great. So if they try the mayonnaise, they can fix it themselves. So if it sticks, you just get a spatula or a knife and you're, you're good to go again. Uh -huh. So I've got, um, I'll use this, this spatula here. So I just put the pumpkin in. And really, you're only 
limited by what's in your fridge and your imagination. I'm using pumpkin here, um, but you could use, I think Joe's got some passata. Um, you could yeah, use I'll put passata on. Yeah. Um, pesto is always a good one. If you've got a jar of pesto, or better still, if you go into um, your gardens and see what have I got, I can make a pesto. You don't have to do traditional pestos with basil. You can use um, you can use rocket, you can use spinach, you can use nasturtiums, you can even use um, dandelions if you wanted to. So what should I put on here? I've got pumpkin on here now. I'd like in the comments a few suggestions of what you think would be nice with it, and I'll go with um, what people suggest. So, Kirsty, just out of interest, how often do you would you go to the the bulk food shop and stock up? Do you do that, you know, once a week or just whenever you need to? Or I, yeah, look, look. it's a bit random for me. I often go weekly, mm. um, but sometimes I don't. It depends how busy I am and what I what I need to have. I get my milk from there, and this milk comes in a glass bottle. So I've oh. got to return the milk to, to, to get to take the bottles back and do it, and it's the most local place. So therefore I go there fairly frequently for the milk. But in having yeah. said that, this milk will last for a couple of weeks anyway, and it always lasts longer than the day before it's sour. Um, I should actually even add, I started talking about milk before and sour milk, but the thing with milk too is the case of I really hate these date stands. I understand why they use them, but it actually creates a huge amount of food waste. Um, yeah. I would say that... If you, I leave my milk out all day, it's not going to last until that, the date. On the flip side, if the use by date was today, the 21st of August, the milk is not going to be sitting there at 11.55 p.m. saying, radio, we've got five minutes and we're going to self-combust and not be okay. That's just not how it works. Um, if yeah. you ever smell milk and it doesn't smell okay, then it's, it's, it's not okay. And if it's not <coughs> okay, it doesn't matter what you're going to do. So because I've got to get my milk, I get my milk from there quite um, frequently that I do pop in um, regularly. Um, but it, it, it really does depend. But for me, it's very close. So it's very easy for me to pop in. But often I'll do, I tend not to get the same things each time. Like if I need to get usually, I'll get a big thing of usually and that'll probably last me a month. So I'm not getting a small amount each time. But people really have to work it into how they shop and make it work for them. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds really good. Um, you can actually freeze milk too. You know, it, on those occasions when you've bought too much, and um, yeah, you can put put it in the um, freezer if it doesn't before it goes off. Yeah. Or if you're going away. And you yeah, yeah. So um, I'm up to the. Uh, the stage of uh, dressing the pizza, as you can see, and I thought um, I might I might get one of my uh, pickled gherkins out just because, why not? And I'll chop that up and getting to the bottom of this jar, but it's a big jar, so that'll serve me well as a re as a repurposing jar. So uh, here we go. I'll just chop. Um, I'll chop up this uh, this cucumber. Uh, what do I want? Nice. Do you do cheese on top or cheese underneath? Do you know what? It depends what I think to put it on. Yeah. But some people are really particular about it, and I've been adamantly told that it has to be underneath, and I've been adamantly told that it has to be on top. Um, mm -hmm. I so maybe people can tell us what they think. Oh. Um, unless no. the pineapple pizza, yes, I absolutely love pineapple on pizza. I don't have pineapple here today, but I often um, use pineapple. I, I prefer to get fresh pineapple apple, and um, I'll use that just to we'll put pineapple in burgers or something like that. So I often have bits and pieces of pineapple to use, which is which is good. I've also got a the feta, which I'm going to pop on too. Now the um, actually, I'll save this. I'll give you a bit of an update on the the uh, 
single use plastic act in New South Wales, which I was mm. involved in a launch um, of, a, of a wonderful detail of that, which I'll tell everyone in a minute. I'll just I'll just finish off here. I'm putting a bit of sweet potato on it. And Oliver recommended when she saw all those potatoes that I should uh, I should use those as a base. Oh wow. Oh, yeah, that would be nice. Um, but I may do that on the second one. But now okay. I'll, I'll do, oh, that's right, I wanted to put a bit of fennel on. I'll shave a bit of fennel on there too. So I've got the one done with my pumpkin base. Do you want to pop it? There we go. Oh, look at that. That's looking good. So that's that really great. Good. I'm going to put that one in actually. 15 minutes. That's about 15 minutes. So what will I put on the second one? I want to do something different. Maybe I might do a garlic base. I'm going to keep it plain this time. So I'm going to get a little bit of olive oil. And I'm going to brush the olive oil. Actually... You know what? I'm not going to get this olive oil because I have this beautiful feta and I love these glass jars. I just reuse them and reuse them and there's oil in here. So I will use that oil on here because that's already flavoured with, um, I don't know, the peppercorns and herbs that are in there. Mm, yeah, I've put some of that on mine too. And I'm going to brush a bit of garlic on because why not? Kick the vampires away. So I might just show you mine. I've got one with pumpkin and one oh. with uh, the mushies, mushies and uh, mushies and uh, spinach and the old uh, pumpkin and capsicum. So I reckon I might pop it in now. Would that be all right? Yep, How quick in. was that? Okay. Uh, this is taking a while because we're having a chat. But if you yeah. next time without anybody else to talk to, like they'd be done by now. Oh, they'd be you'd be eating them by now, 45 minutes. Absolutely. Okay, I had a, a mystery element, everyone. Mystery element. The old sesame seeds. Oh. So there's my pizza. It's Ooh, ready to that go looks in. Good. Yeah. Um I shaved the fennel. Um, I don't know whether the Italian pizza gods of Napoli would, um, you know, uh, apply such methods, but, you know, the purpose of this is to use what we have. So I've used, you know, I've pretty much used everything that was in that pan, the zucchini and the carrots that were left over, and on the second pizza I'll use all this. So I'm going to put that one in. Um, here we go. And that's what this is all about, just using using what you've got. Um, you might do a combination, which you think, Radio, we've done that combination. Maybe we won't do it again. The way I see it is what you're messing with, dinner. And on the other hand, you might do a combination and you might have gone, I love cooking with kids um, because kids actually don't have any preconceived ideas of what should go on a pizza, usually. And if they just go in and they pick what's in the garden or use whatever you put in front of them, they will come up with things. I'm putting avocado on now and I just did a workshop and, and some of the parents were really surprised to put avocado on a pizza. I'm like, let the kids decide. And the, there were, the, the kid there that never eats avocado that decided to put it on a pizza and all of a sudden avocado is now a thing. So just experiment. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. I thought I'd grate a bit of parmesan on the top. Mm. Costa doesn't do things by half in the kitchen. But no, the New South Wales fans, they've, um, I think it was the 1st of July they started. They brought in the plus, they brought in things in different, um, different states to Victoria and the other states. Each state's doing their own thing. Right. We'll well, find that... the that they'll level out and they'll catch up to each other. But because it's state, um, done by state legislation, not federal, it's just whenever the state's ready to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, and some some states further ahead than others. I think South Australia um, uh, have, have always been a bit a bit ahead. 
you know, they they do the um, the refunds for uh, bottles and things yeah, like that. Yeah, they're about twenty years ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that I'll tell you. Um, actually, I'll just roll this base out, and then I'll tell you what's happened in New South Wales. Yeah. Um, here we go. Base number two. Bit of flour. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a bit more liberal with my flour dusting this time, so that. Uh, but yeah, Scotty Ross, who uh, who reckoned I needed to add a bit more flour, you're spot on, mate. I think now I've got that perfect perfect amount. I'll just spread that out a bit so that I know it's going to. Um, now I've probably put too much, which is always a a wonderful overreaction. That's um, okay. But that's okay, isn't it? You, you figure out what the balance is. Now I've got my second one go. ready. And what I've done here, if we can see that on the screen, is I've actually oh. got chicken skin on this one. Nice. With some mushroom, uh, avocado, and um, capsicum. And I almost forgot I was going to put it on the, the, the pumpkin one, but I'll put it on this one. Just I, I, I want to see what it's like to have almonds on it and give it something crunchy. Because why not? Oh, yeah. I don't know if I'll do it again. Maybe I'll love it. Maybe I won't. But um, I, I was I was always going to do. I was looking at recipes. I was going to put some pomegranate seeds on one, and then I realised that I forgot that I was going to do it, and I had that for breakfast, and that was the last of my pomegranate seeds. <laughs> right? I'm putting this one in. the research, Joe, because you interviewed a lot of the um, policy makers as well. Yeah, yeah. And so um, that that work is still uh, ongoing. And so we're really looking at all of the policy documents in different states and looking at the way they think and talk about um, householders. And so we found that there was a really kind of strong uh, concentration on recycling you know, all of that stuff about which bin and what goes where, which is kind of different in every state and, in fact, can sometimes change between council boundaries. So it is a challenging issue. But, um, yeah, so focusing on recycling and also um, public education, which is which is great. And I know that you, Kirsty, have worked with um, uh, some local councils to do kind of education sessions and I know that, um, yeah, a lot of local councils do do great uh, sessions. But, yeah, we were thinking that there really wasn't um, kind of emphasis on on what else householders could do and on, on kind of, you know, working out more challenging things around um, reducing waste overall uh, perhaps funding community gardens, perhaps thinking about, uh, you know, the circular economy, uh, not just with metals and things, but with um, with all of the materials that go through our house, so our houses. So, uh, yeah, we, there are fantastic um, people working in policy and trialling new um, things, uh, but it's kind of like, um, there's there's also uh, a whole lot of gaps in different uh, areas of Australia where you would like to um, be able to, you know, um, ha uh, use less waste and uh, recycle it more effectively. So, for example, you know, with those red cycle programs, uh, not all supermarkets offer those um, and uh, not all jurisdic jurisdictions offer those. So... Uh, yeah, so it's been really interesting and we're putting that um, together. But also things are changing quite quickly in the waste kind of area. So it's a good time to be working in it. The, yeah, um, so. the interesting thing I'll, I'll bring up there, Joe. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was fortunate enough, hang on, I'll show people my head rather than just my torso. Um, a couple of weeks ago here in Sydney, I went to uh, what was the launch of um, a program which was basically a partners program. So the EPA here in New South Wales, the Environment Protection Agency, 
acknowledge that, you know, and, and this is the important thing. At the end of the day, a protection agency needs to have bite. It, it's it's not about delivering education. It has a role around education, but its main duty is to ensure that, that you know, policy and guidelines and um, control measures are carried out. Um, so to get the message across to people, people aren't as receptive to a, 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 an EPA as they are to their local groups. So what they've done is partner with 17 different local groups. So we're talking Parents and Citizens Association, Men's Shed Association, Country Women's, Take Three for the Sea, Grow It Local, um, um, National Retailers Association, Shopping Centre Association, um, um, you know, all, the, all those kind of groups that cover across business, enterprise, but most of all, uh, local local groups. And when you, t when you think about it like that, you know that basically people are going to listen to groups that they already listen to. They yeah. don't want to be preached to by another government agency. So it's a really, um, it's, it's the way forward. Partnerships are the way forward because if you're already going to the, to your, to your local men's shed, that's where conversations are going to take place. The CWA, the Parents and Citizens Association, they can put it out to all schools as a wonderful sort of conversation point at a meeting. And it doesn't have to be that someone's coming to give this formal lecture. It's like, hey, this is the drum. Um, this is the, the latest on the, the first phase of the ban. So the first phase of the ban was on the lightweight plastic bags, which was the 1st of June. But their partnership is with all of these groups so that on the 1st of November, when the next serious bans come in, which are single-use coffee cups, polystyrene, plastic knives and forks, plastic um, um, chopsticks, uh, all of those things, that comes in on the 1st of November. So basically there was a five-month five five month period where these local groups can not only start the conversations but make the preparations because that's what happened last time. They just dropped it on people and everyone just arced up and then they buckled and the supermarket said, oh, well, we'll give you, we're going to ban plastic bags, but we'll give you a plastic bag. You know, yeah. that was a debacle because yeah. everyone buckled at the first thing of, like people blowing up, like they're yeah. always going to blow up when you change a behaviour that's been driven by convenience and the yeah. dollar value that people are going to go, oh, no, this is this is not my habit, this is my culture. And, yeah. and so changing that culture months out, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And the other, the other point that I was really excited about um, yeah, um, was that it's also like in the, in the act, the single-use plastic ban act and circular economy so the fact that circular economy is now in the language it means that it's now accountable and yeah. people can drive that language further if we don't have the language then we don't have the communication around it so i mean for some you might go yeah that's just a nuance but from experience i think when the language is is concurrent with the change then you yeah. really get it embedded but if the language comes later or if the language comes too soon without the understanding and the education you, you you end up losing people one way or the other so i was very happy to see that circular economy is in an act which means that that gets circulated from the top down and then the local groups be it take three for the sea and all of the the, the, the people associated with beaches or be it the people associated with food through community groups and community garden groups, they share that language into their space and it just becomes part of the dialect. And, uh, yeah, so that's the latest. It's Look, it's still going to require some change, but when you've also got the businesses, the retailers association saying to businesses, well, you cannot do that. This is We're all on this. It's not as someone pointing a finger at you it's all of us in it together I, I i'm very you know and then and then we've got to go next step as you said joe and make it national right yeah and, yeah well it was yeah. it's great to see some of the um comments in the chat about what's happening in different parts of the country a uh, uh, comment about it uh you know canberra being pretty far ahead in terms of their um single use 
uh, plastic and, um, well, uh, banning it. And also in Queensland that they're um, moving away from um, plastic cutlery. So, yeah, it's fantastic that um, uh, people are just moving ahead with it and hopefully um, it will become national, as you say. And one of the best ways to experience it is really to go to a place where um, the, you, you can't get any single-use plastic and you find that you can um, cope quite well. Alive. That's yeah. right. It's not the um, end of the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, um, uh, uh, a friend of mine did a, a, a kid's book and she um, was looking back at life in the 1970s and um, I can't remember this myself, but um, people used to go and get takeaway with their own saucepans. So you'd take your saucepans in and get your takeaway and then come home and um, put it on the stove to uh, heat it up. So it's like, oh, wow, that's a really uh, good lesson from history. Absolutely. And I think the biggest thing, and someone said it's so confusing in between the states, it is confusing, but it is what it is. You've just got to do the best you can. The biggest thing, and, and Joe mentioned it before, is that there's a, a huge amount of focus on recycling. And yeah. recycling, the reality is we've had 30 years to do recycling, and recycling is important that we do, but it's definitely not the solution. The reality yeah. is, you know, I've got this, this milk bottle here. This milk bottle, when it's finished, it's going to go back, it's going to be cleaned up, it's going to be used again. But if there was any other type of bottle and I put it into my recycling bin, they'd actually take it and they'd smash it when it was perfectly usable to make it into something again. It just doesn't make sense. Circular is not just about smashing something up or melting it down and creating it new. It's about reusing and preventing that, that waste in the first place. So yeah. with these, it's, what it's really important for us to do as consumers is to really look for that reuse option. So the, the key cups for the coffee cup, that's the biggest thing that people will relate to when I speak about that. They take their cup in and, and, they, and they do that. Um, straws. Straws is really interesting in the sense that um, in the talks I do on reducing plastic waste, I always ask, so who likes paper straws? Um, yet to tell, hear from somebody who absolutely loves them. The reality is you don't need to have a straw to have a drink. You can drink out of a cup. Um, yeah. If you do like to have a straw, that's okay. You can get reusable straws and get them and, and reuse them. But just think about that reuse option. So do we need to have a substitute for a straw? Most of the time we don't. And for those who do need them for medical reasons, they are actually able to continue using them, which is fine and it's great. And we can take that further as well too. My concern is we're actually switching out the cutlery to bamboo um, or some non-plastic cutlery but if it's still single use, we're just creating another problem. So what we need to do is go, how can we avoid that? And I know I, I actually like to take, um, I've got a little, I don't have a hand, hand to show, but like a little um, set that I can take with me with my cutlery. So if I do eat out and there, there's plastic cutlery, then I can use my own cutlery. Or I'll order accordingly so I don't need to have that waste. But what's even better is when you can actually sit down and enjoy it. And we, if we can stop making the the single use so convenient. If it starts to become inconvenient, then that's when the change will happen. So Absolutely, so we have to make it. We have to make it inconvenient and maybe a little bit expensive to buy a fork. You know, if we made them fifty cents or a buck each, then maybe it wouldn't seem so weird to bring your own fork. Absolutely, Sustainable Victoria said that the reduction in plastic bags in Victoria since they they made the changes is seventy percent. That's a seventy percent reduction. Now, uh, there's no doubt we can do better than that, but if we compare that to coffee cups and other types of single-use waste, if there was a fee on that the same way, then people would rethink, especially with cutlery. And what gets me with cutlery is that people buy something takeaway and they go home and eat it, or they go to the lunchroom at work and eat it. There's cutlery there. They don't need to have it. So it can be really easy to reduce it if we just um, are sensible about it. Yeah. Scotty Bailey said here, you know, we have reusable straws in the car. Kristen Blackley, I try to remember my keep cup when I go do my shop so I can have my coffee fix and I take my canvas bags. It's just habit. And as as you embed that new habit, then it's really, it's, it's purely and simply then part of the culture and it's who you are and it's what you represent and it's the image you give out to the rest of the public. And, you, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be a, uh, you know, you don't have to just stop on one day, you know, cut yourself some slack. But as you get 
you know, further down the road, then if you do forget it, you go, all right, well, I, I need to I need to fine tune that that behavior a little more and I, I I'll go without it this time just to make the reminder call a bit stronger. But but you don't do that at the beginning, let alone force that on someone else, because then you're just being a you know a, a zealot and and we've had enough mandates and things for a lifetime. And yeah. no one wants a mandate, you gotta you gotta get the buy-in. And the more buy-in we get, then the more that you know Joe's project and and the the essence behind it will will become day to day just normal. And yeah. there won't need to be a stick from yep. from a government body, but um you know people will just be the, the, their own their own managers. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So question everyone. There's my um oh which camera am I looking at? Uh that's that that's one. Everything. So that's the potato base, sweet oh. potato and potato base. Now, what else should I add? Should I put a bit of fennel on there? Yes. Can I put it to the people? Yeah. I've got fennel and I've got some zucchini left. Um, what do the, what say the people? Yeah, that is, that is a good um, point about Nutella and their cups. Oh. So what I've quickly done, I made up another, just while the comments are coming in, yes, Scott Ross says yes, fennel. Look here, I just found this in the fridge when I put the tomato back in, a little bit of kimchi. It's oh. good for me. So I'm going to put a bit of kimchi on this one. We definitely yes. don't have to be traditional. Oh, it's that's getting exotic kimchi. Yeah, so a little bit of kimchi. I'll put some fennel and zucchini, according to uh, um, Ange and Christy and Nicola and Scott. So, yeah, fennel's going on. I might do a multiple. I might do a multiple arrangement, everyone. I'll do some pieces of fennel, but I'll also do a bit of grated fennel. Oh, that kimchi smells good. Whew. That's got a bit of pepper in it, Nicola. No, who wanted pepper? De Deb. Deb Drummond wants me to pepper it up. I'll get my pepper. Ange wants you to put uh, leafy greens on. What's that? The leafy greens. Ange wanted you to put a bit of leafy greens on. Crocodile oh, spinach. okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, I'll put it on only, at the end. You've only got the kale, haven't you? Yeah. There's plenty of pepper, Deb. I've got some rocket I'm going to put on when it comes out as dancing. <laughs> Man, that's peppered up. I can smell it. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, zucchini, look at that. The last couple of tiny bits of zucchini. Beautiful. Now, what I'm going to do, I've actually just made up a, 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 a second smaller batch of the dough. And the reason I've done this is just to show quite often because I've got teenage boys, like that two isn't enough, they'll eat one of those each on their own. So I'll double it, but I'll have a bit left over. And if I've got that bit left over and don't feel like having extra pizza, I'll turn that into scone. So I've just got this here and I've got, got some um, spring onion. This is spring onion that's been growing on my bench from spring onion that I had before. And I'll just kind of put that in and I'm just going to mix that in with a bit of cheese and I'll get about... Four little scones out of this, which we can oh, have. Oh, nice! Right, yeah. So it's just, just um, messing it, you're mixing it around. So I tend to do a savoury scone with this after I put the mustard in. That better there. So just two times. You don't want to work heavy. It's just a fold, fold, fold. I hope there's no CWA ladies looking at me because I'm sure they'll tell me I'm doing it wrong. But it's what we're doing. <laughs> <and that's okay. laughs> So now we've done that, I make it kind of a round or square shape. Just push it down. I tend not to get my rolling pin out. I could, but I tend not to because I, I don't need that flat. And then I will just cut them into four triangle pieces. If I, I could do it fancy with the others, and I would just pop those in. I'll put a little bit of milk on top, and now I've got four scones for an extra 
extra snack. They'll take about 15 to 20 minutes in the oven. You know, they're done with their because that's quick if you if you just think you know what it's like doing one pizza and not doing the math you can get two um two different uh recipes out of the one yeah i'm gonna do that with a bit of, bit of mine now <laughs> so um do you put a bit of herbs or something in your scone or do you just do it plain kirsty right i've got um you could put herbs in i've just done some um chives and cheese oh yeah chives and cheese that's right <laughs> Absolutely be really quite nice. And you don't have to put the milk on top, but I just think it browns it a bit nicer if you do. I'm doing this a cheeky way. I, I wouldn't let my kids do a lot of different sport, but that's the way I'm doing it today. And I put them on a tray and they'll be they'll be done. I'm not sure. Probably not too much longer. Actually, wasn't yet. Um, I'm just. I'll put a bit of cheese on the top of this one, and then um, and then the potato one is ready to go. I put the fennel on there. I better check that other pizza. I hope I haven't burnt it. <laughs> yeah, mine's good. You need to use the timer. I'm using that for the recording. <laughs> All right, this baby's ready. There it is. All right, one in, one out. Is nice and crispy. Here we go. Have a look at this one, Ger uh, um, Gersty and Joe. Oh, that looks good. I'm so right, glad I had my honey mine. I would just want to jump through and eat that. I'll put a, I'll get my little roller cutter and uh, chop it up and offer some to everyone. <laughs> I'm going to hold my very little now. This is the, uh, the pumpkin and um, caramelized onion. And what else? Oh, yeah, that's nice. Mm. And this one is a bit hard to handle. There we go. And, yeah, so normally if I do do these without talking to anyone, I'll, I'll get the dinner will be out. 15 minutes in the, in the um, oven, so I can get them out in, in 25 to 30 minutes, depending how fast I work and how much is chopped. So it's a really quick and easy thing to do. And there's nothing, I just think it's crazy sometimes if I just do this, and I might go, right, I've just had a busy day, it hasn't worked out, or a takeaway, and then I could have thrown some of this stuff out. So a piece like this on your belt is a really um, great way to, to save um, waste and save money. Yeah. Well, it's tricky, isn't it? Because if you think about it, the fact that you don't use that stuff and then you buy takeaway, then you throw that stuff away, it's actually the takeaway is a lot more expensive than you think because yes. you've got to put the value of all those things that you didn't end up eating and or threw out onto the, the cost of, of what the takeaway is. And, you know, you make these two pizzas, you know, a pizza is going to cost you 24 bucks, um, you know, unless you're going for like the, the super the – super, um, cheap takeaway versions but even then you know the whatever they are they're still they're, they're not cheap so you just go man that that did not cost me 24 dollars to make given that it was all leftovers and i've got two pizzas for that matter and i'm now going to chop it up and offer it around here we go <laughs> Karen's wanting an express uh, package, uh, Costa. Karen Sanchez. No, if people uh, if people have the app, it's the Costa Home Pizza Delivery app. Um, I'll just put it straight on. Look at that. That came off so clean and neatly. Yeah. Off this base. And um, now I'll just get my knife. And here we go. Uh, 
Which camera is that on? Nah. I can't do it. How are you going there, Joe? Are yours still the oven or out? Yeah, mine are good. Look Ladies and gentlemen, your pizza is served. And so is your pizza here. Oh. Here in Abbotsford. Aha. Uh -huh. There's that one. That was the um that was the pumpkin and uh, capsicum number with a little bit of feta. And the old the mushroom one. Well, that was a bit rustic. It's a bit of a crazy shape, but anyway, uh, that's that's uh, mushroom and uh, spinach. So yeah, I'm very pleased with those. Thanks, Kirsty. Obviously, doesn't matter. By the time that it's over, the, the evidence is always going to be gone, <laughs> and it, yes. it might be gone forever. But aside from that, you know, it really doesn't matter. That's right. Cut them up; they'll go down a tree. Yeah, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm I'm not a chef. I don't aspire to be a chef. I love chefs. I think they're amazing. But this is what I do every single day, all day. So I cook, you know, of an evening and I cook really simple things that I can get out very, very quickly with my skill set. <laughs> I'm a home cook. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Um, I reckon on the first one, I rock. Costa, we lost one of you. Mm. Coming back. Costa, we lost you. Are you, um, yeah, maybe you went back. Costa, we've lost your volume. We can't hear you. I, I, know, I know he's trying to tell us something and he doesn't know. <laughs> Mm. So what actually happens is, is we run the sound through the, the the phones rather than the computers, and I think that's the computer, so we can't hear you. Costa, we cannot hear you, and he doesn't know that we can't hear him. Mm. <laughs> but he'll he'll wait for us to talk soon. Hmm. Yeah, this, this has happened before, but fortunately <laughs> we, we did one of the sessions, he dropped out quite quite early. Um, what I might, might mention while we're trying to get Costa back in, and I don't think he realises that his other ones dropped out and we don't have the sound. Um, if you want to hear more about um, the Low Waste Living Research, um, the Zero Waste Festival is on in the, on 17th of September, which is just short of four weeks' time. Um, Joe will be there with uh, myself um, as well as some of the other participants in the study and we'll keep, talk more about it. Um, throughout the day, there'll be different discussion points on different topics. We've got food, we've got fashion. Uh, we're having a clothing swap so you can bring your clothes and uh, bring them in and go home with new clothes. Um, there'll be a repair cafe so you can get your broken things um, fixed. That's by the volunteers from the St Kilda Repair Cafe and a few other volunteers as well too. We've got kids' activities so kids can be reducing their waste. And I wish I could tell you more than I can at this very moment, but we're finishing the day off with a documentary screening of something that's very new in Australia, first time to be screened in Melbourne, but we'll be releasing those details uh, this, later this week. So if you keep an eye on Zero Waste Victoria, um, their Facebook page and their website, if you're in Melbourne, um, we'd love to have you come along as well too. Um, now I'm not quite sure if Costa knows if, he, if, if we can. I think he might be trying to. He looks like he's trying to do something. Um, can you hear us, Costa? Because we couldn't hear before. No, we can't hear you. <laughs> But um, while while we're making announcements, um, Kirsty, I'm really looking forward to um, you uh, uh, to joining you at the Zero Waste Festival. I, I can't wait for that. So it's it's going to be down at Fed Square, isn't it? That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've also got um, another opportunity 
uh, for people to come and hear about uh, the Low Waste Living Study. Or you can just um, tune in, actually. It's going to be a webinar. And so it's on for Social Sciences Week on um, September 6th. So I'll, um, I'll post out. You can, you can have a look for uh, the Low Waste Living Study at Monash and find out the details. And I'll also uh, pass that on to Kirsty. So looking forward to, um, you know, listening to the people who are actually in the study, like Kirsty, talk about their experiments and how they went and uh, what they're doing next. So, Costa, have we got you back? Oh, can you hear me? Yay! You're back. Awesome. Um, Excellent. Yeah, that's great news about the Zero Waste Conference, everyone, particularly down down in Melbourne. Um, Kirsty will uh, no doubt put all the links there. Oh, there they are. There it is, right? <laughs> How good is that? I only needed to think about it, and and there they that's were. That's amazing. Well, I, um, I don't know how you do that, Costa. Yeah, no, that's that's just next level. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, look, I that that next pizza's going along well. This one tastes a treat. I'm really happy with it. Uh, Joe, thanks for um, thanks for being involved. And look, hopefully, when it gets to the next level, we can have another little cook up and um get everyone on again and, and learn more about this process oh, and how how far you're progressing these ideas. And, you know, it's a real, um, it's a real, it's a real privilege to, to sort of be able to amplify these messages to, uh, to a broader network for you. Oh, it's really, we re appreciate it so much. Um, you are both my heroes, Costa and um, Kirsty. So it's been such a thrill. Thank you so much for, um, Having me um, here tonight, it's been great. So if you pop in um, the chat, you know, our, our private chat, then I yes. can actually chat for everybody to see. Uh, the uh, details? Yes, yeah, so you did a chat where you came and you said hi, Kirsty, at the very start. <laughs> yeah, all right. right I might... Sorry, everyone. Uh, uh... That way, I'd be interested in hearing um, more depth from all the researchers and more people on um, September the 6th, then you can get that link. If you pop that in there, I'll be able to share it to everybody. All right. Yes, I know. The problem is I've only got one piece of um, uh, technology uh, working at the moment, so I'll be going That's off air here. We can do it later. That's not a problem. All right. Awesome. Thank you. That'll be so much easier. Otherwise, hey, you just um, watch me scrolling through. For those of you... Um... Ange Oliver has picked up just in the corner of frame there. That's my COVID eggshell pile, um, which uh, scans along the windowsill, as you can see, and keeps going. Um, and for those of you who are on my Instagram, I have a thing called uh, Chooky Bingo, where I weigh my eggs on a scale. People, uh, People predict how many grams it is and, you know, the winner ends up with some sort of random prize. But uh, my next tricky bingo is going to be me blending these eggs in my blender in this thing. And uh, people will have to determine how many containers, how many uh, plastic containers I can fill with my COVID egg pile. Um, so watch this space, everyone. I'll let Facebook know when I'm doing it on Insta. But, uh, yeah, look, it's been a treat. Um, Kirsty, uh, do you want to come back on to the, to the, to the share screen? Uh, oh, there we are. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for watching because the only bummer for those of you who are watching is that, you know, you don't get sated in the sense that we've made it and I'm now eating it. But I think we're too. I Hopefully, um, it will just urge you to have a crack at it because it's so much fun. And gee, that was really easy. And and you know you could effectively do this in in a third of the time that we've done it. So this has been an hour and twenty five yeah. with a lot of banter and and carry on um, between Joe and and Kirsty and I, which is what <laughs> it's about. I mean. You know, it would be so nice to be doing this 
Well, I feel like we're just doing it all together in the kitchen and we're over at Kirsty's or at my place or whatever. And, and I think that's the fun. So, um, yeah, don't hesitate to give it a crack and uh, let us know how you go with it because uh, you can only get better at your bases, I reckon. That's right. And I'll put a link in there as well too, which goes directly to a blog post of mine, which has the recipe. And uh, given time, I might link this back in there. But if you want to make it tonight or tomorrow and you can't and you don't want to watch it again, then just go straight to the post. Oh, thanks, Kay. There was an, a question there. I must eat a lot of eggs. <laughs> this is two and a... Well, this is probably <laughs> two, and a, two and a half years. And... There's also a lot of eggs there where I make this particular Greek soup that I give to people and I usually use about half a dozen eggs and I've probably made about, I would have conservatively over that period of time, that's it, sort of one of my care package specials. So I reckon I've probably made about 40 of those. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of the eggs have gone into that. But, yeah, Tookie Bingo will come up. Um, okay, if you're done, uh, I'll sign off. Any Any final words? Yeah, I just I just pulled the scones out. So can we switch that over there? So here are the scones that I pulled out. They're a little bit oh. wonky the way I did them, but they'll be a little snack. So it's kind of a two in one that I love to do. I don't always get leftovers. I did make them intentionally there, but they're just a little um, easy thing to do. If you want them perfectly round, you can get a cutter out. But I intentionally done it like this because I just like quick and fast. But um, yeah, well, we'll have to pick another date and get back to it. Um, and maybe one day we'll cook at a kitchen that together, Costa. Fantastic, Kirsty. Well, I just pulled this out. It's not quite ready, but it's steaming along. By the time I finish that pizza, that one will be ready. But I think I'll, um, I think I'll just, I think I'll just cook it, and uh, I can reheat it and have it tomorrow. So, um, from uh, Kirsty and uh, myself, and of course Joe. Thanks everyone for joining us behind the scenes. A big thanks to our vision, vision and comment switcher, because normally we're doing it ourselves, but uh, it's a bit hard to do that when we're we're um, yeah. when we're cooking. So a big thanks to Sarah, who's uh, running the uh, soundproof booth there and uh, and spinning the vision <laughs> and picking the cameras. I must say it worked really well with the two cameras that you could see everything. But uh, thank you, Sarah, and thanks everyone for your comments. It's been a hoot and. Um, yeah, until our next one. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Costa. And ciao, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I might have to ask Sarah to end the broadcast because I uh, Hang on, where can I go? Leave. Would that be it? It's a bit different on the mobile.